Good morning. Hello. Saturday morning, 11 o'clock, which means it's time to learn about your cameras. <laughs> Sounded a little bit cheesy, didn't it? Hello. I'm Paul. Those of you who are tuning in for the first time, where have you been for the last nine weeks? Hello. Hello. Um, eight weeks, actually. So this is week eight. And today we're going to talk about bracketing. Um, quick recap. Week one. Oh, that's weeks ago. Wow, um, we looked into ISO, so light sensitivity, how the camera, um, how you can tell the camera how much light is available, set the light levels um, by telling it what ISO to shoot at, so 100, 200, 400, etc, etc, not using auto. Um, week two, we looked at aperture, part one of kind of, well, part two of the exposure control triangle, um, and we looked at how you would deal with the... Uh, the aperture, what it does, it lets light through the lens, creates uh, a hole in the lens using uh, uh, using a diaphragm blade to open and close to then give you a hole for the light to go through, which then goes into the camera body. Obviously, that controls the amount of detail and around your main point of focus as well. And we also looked at how to control your focus point manually. Week three, shutter. So we have the light, we've, we've set the sensitivity to light using ISO. We've told the camera how much light we want to let through to give us the right amount of depth of field, the right amount of detail and around your main point of focus. And then week three was shutter speed where we looked at how you control um, the speed of the light, if you like, coming through the lens and, and how the camera then translates movement. So how much movement is shown, how much movement is captured, freezing motion, showing motion. Week four, this is a test for me to remember what we've done and how we've done it. Week four was, was complete manual exposure control. So in aperture and shutter, we looked at using the priority modes. Where aperture priority, you set the aperture, the camera then sets the shutter, shutter speed for you because you've set the ISO. Um, and shutter was obviously shutter priority, you set the shutter speed, camera does the aperture. Uh, manual, it's just about doing it all yourself, yeah? So if you want the image to be lighter or darker, or, you know, if you want a certain shutter speed for a certain reason, how to then balance things out and get the correct exposure or get the exposure you want. Uh, we then looked at white balance, week five. Um, so we've got the light coming through the cam coming through the lens. We've set, you know, the sensitivity with ISO. We've set the aperture to control our depth of field. We've then got the right... Uh, the right speed for the shutter speed to get A, the correct exposure, and B, to get the right amount of motion or the motion you want to show in the image, be it frozen motion, be it capturing motion, a bit of blur, you know. Um, but the white balance then controls how, what colour the light looks when it hits your sensor and how it eventually kind of renders. So you, what shows white as what shows white in your, uh, when you're looking for your viewfinder, actually is then rendered white in um in your image. Then we looked at metering. I'm trying to remember. Metering. Um, so yes, we've told the camera how much light is available by using your ISO, but the metering, the camera, it's how the camera judges light. So how it, um, how the, the, the way the camera deals with light, the way the camera sees light and how that will then affect your image. Um, last week we looked at, what do we look at? Black and white? Ah, oh, black and white last week. Very surprised I managed to keep it within the hour last week rather than waffle on. Um, so black and white last week, what a black and white process is, where it came from, the wet process of film and paper and dev and stop and fix and washing and toning and so on. And how if you put certain colours of filters, certain colour effects in front of your, um, in front of your lens, what effect that has. And obviously that can be done electronically in this situation. Today we're going to talk about bracketing. Bracketing is probably one of the most underused functions or techniques. It's more of a technique than a function, but we'll, there is a function built into the camera that guides you through bracketing. But it's probably one of the most, for my mind, underused um, techniques, photographic techniques out there, because um, not a lot of people know about it, and a lot, do you know what, you act nine times out of ten, you end up doing it without realising. Um, so, yeah, we're going to have a look at that this morning. So, let's jump on to the presentation. I don't really need that, so let's get rid of that. 
and let's go to bracketing. So you should now be able to see that. Awesome sausages. So let's just move the comments window out of the way. So bracketing. What is bracketing? Yeah, bracketing is a general technique of taking several images of the same subject using different camera settings to guarantee your imagined image. So as I said during manual, um, during the, the manual lesson, it's always helpful to know what you're trying to achieve. So you've got, you, know, you can see your scene, you can see what's going on, and using your manual settings, it's always helpful when you're using your manual settings or any image, when you're capturing any image, depending, regardless of what mode you're in, of having a decent idea of what you want to try and achieve, your imagined image. So bracketing is generally used in tricky lighting situations to try and get the best exposure, to try and get what you feel is best with that one single frame. And you find the reason you do this, so, so if you're in Aperture Priority, for example, and you're taking a view of, I don't know, a landscape, you're on holiday, for example, and the sun is setting over the sea. <laughs> Try saying that four times quickly. Um, the sun is setting over the sea, um, and with what the camera feels is correct, so Aperture Priority, you set your aperture, I don't know, F11, your ISO 100, the camera says you can have, I don't know, you might feel that's a little bit dark you might feel that's a little bit bright so in in your priority modes you can you can change your aperture you can change your shutter speed in those certain priority modes but it's not going to make much of a difference because the camera is going to going to keep to what it thinks is right priority modes you set the aperture the camera will then for example aperture priority you set the aperture the camera will then decide what shutter speed will give you correctly balanced, correctly exposed image. So you can go to manual and tweak that, or, you know, to go up a bit and go down a bit, and that's bracketing, basically. So these little variations, these little tweaks in the exposure, more manual control rather than uh, changing things in the, in the priority modes, are going to allow you to see subtle differences, which can make a massive difference to your image. So exposure bracketing, this is where most people start. So when you start to play with bracketing or you think, okay, you know, you hear something, you, you see a lesson like this online, you, you know, someone tells you about bracketing, exposure bracketing. Um, most people, most photographers will generally start bracketing on their exposure. Because as I said, you know, you're on holiday, you've got this beautiful, beautiful sunset over the sea and the beach and the sky is looking absolutely beautiful, but you're thinking, do you know what, that's a little bit bright. So by bracketing, by increasing your shutter speed, you're going to darken the image a little bit, and you're going to maintain those highlights, those beautiful colours in the bright areas. If you then go to a slower shutter speed by extending, extending your exposure, you're going to overexpose, let more light in, and what that does, that will bring more detail into your shadow area, but you'll lose your highlights. So it's a it's a subtle it's a subtle choice. So when you're bracketing, you would choose to take a series of photographs at different exposures. So for example, you could do this in manual. Yeah. So you could. Um, we've talked about the the exposure meter inside inside the camera viewfinder. You've seen. You know. You've got the zero in the center, or you've got that that little triangular marker. And you've got the the dash or the line marker that move you can move left or right to under or overexpose, depending on your brand of camera and so on. So you can bracket quite happily purely manually. So you can set the exposure to what the camera thinks is correct. So you've got your little marker on the zero or on that little um, center triangular point, and that's what the camera thinks is correct. That's camera correct exposure. Okay. You think, do you know what? I want that a little darker. So you would then go to the plus, uh, sorry, to the minus side, which is underexposing, and think, actually, let's just see what it looks like a little brighter. And you'd then go to the plus side, which is the overexposure. 
and from that you can make a choice basically as to which you think is the best image. There we go, so your exposure bracketing is generally most effective when dealing with high contrast subjects or lighting situations. Backlit is a really good um, example of when um, bracketing is going to help you. And it's all about, really, bracketing and exposure bracketing is generally more when you're not going to get much of a chance. You know, you have to get it right. So you might be on holiday somewhere where, you know, you're not going to get a chance to go back next year. You've spent thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds at some point soon, <laughs> um, you know, to go somewhere. And, you know, you're on a whistle-stop tour of this place that's, I don't know, uh, the Maldives, for example. Quite expensive to go. You're not really going to go back every year. Um, so by just by taking by bracketing by taking a few different shots of different exposures you've got a half decent chance of getting a shot you're eventually going to like so yes yeah, most so bracketing is generally most effective when dealing with high light um, high contrast subjects or lighting situations backlit uh, backlit subjects so like I mentioned earlier you're looking into a sunset so the sun is coming towards you so the light is at the back of the scene so it's backlighting your frame um, so it's got a strong highlight or shadow area and this is where it's going to become when bracketing becomes most effective to get help you get a half decent image so process of bracketing how you would bracket okay so the first you generally you want to take two or three frames generally three frames and how i would do it i would normally shoot frame number one at the camera suggested exposure so you've got your little marker on that center point yeah on the triangular marker or on the zero depending on your camera brand so that would be what the camera suggests so let's say for example we're back to f11 um iso 100 and i don't know it's given us a 30th of a second one slash 30 a 30th of a second so that's what the camera thinks is right. Okay, you shoot, you go ahead and shoot and think, well, I'm not quite happy with that. So what you would then do is you would then take two further frames, one overexposed, so allowing more light in, so a slower shutter speed, and one underexposed, allowing less light through, which is um, a faster shutter speed. And you can do that, as I said, using your manual exposure mode. So you're in your manual, you've got your center point set on the zero, you've got your center point, your little dash on the center point, so you know that's what the camera thinks is correct. Great. You can then go over and under. So from these three pictures you've taken, you can then decide which is the best for you, which you prefer the most. Yeah, Because I think we've mentioned earlier, and previous things like... Um, uh, white balance and metering you know what you think is correct might be very different to what or what you prefer might be completely different to what is technically correct so it's completely subjective it's your image it's your photograph your memories so you want to make sure that you get it right for you so you've got these three pictures and you can go well I prefer the one that's slightly brighter great You can generally, as I said, achieve this using your M mode, your manual exposure mode. But it can also be achieved using the, the priority mode. So aperture priority on the back of the Canon camera, you've got a little plus and my, AV plus and minus button. And by holding that down and moving your thumb wheel, it will then take your exposure either under or over, depending on which way you push your wheel. Um, but there is an easy way to do it. If you're not particularly comfortable doing that, if you're not particularly comfortable um, adjusting within the priority modes or using the manual functionality of the camera in the manual mode, you can use something called auto exposure bracketing. Now I'm going to just flick cameras now and show you where the auto exposure bracketing is on your camera. So I'm going to whip out my 100D. It's just while I've got you on my screen i'm just going to very quickly put the 100d in front of the other camera so that we can then see what is happening take the lens cap off the 100d paul it helps reason i'm doing this like this is so that we're not you're not going to be basically seeing the camera
camera shaking around and you get a little bit seasick. And when it focuses, it'll be even better. Right, there we go. So let's just flick you back onto the camera. Sorry about that. Let's just flick you back on to camera. Let's come out of And what we're going to do is now let's get keep that out of the way. Bear with me, the tech is letting me down today, guys. What you should now be able to see, there we go. And if I focus and turn that camera back on, it's alive. There we go. So we've got, let's move it back a bit. Right, you should now be able to see the screen here. So, what I'm going to do, so we're in aperture priority, okay? So, we're in aperture priority. Let's just move that up a tad so the dog can see the rabbits my grandmother would have said. It's not wanting to focus for some bizarre reason. Excellent. There we go. So I'm going to go, to, I'm in aperture priority, okay? I'm going to bring into your camera menu and in your shooting mode, so across the top of your menus, obviously this varies from brand to brand, model to model. But this is a Canon EOS 100D. Um, obviously, I'm a Canon user. This is what I happen to have lying around. But um, if you cannot find your, it's generally bracketing is generally if you're a Nikon user in your menu or some of your Nikon cameras have a um, have a button which uh, has the letters B K T on it, and that allows you to manually bracket. Excuse me, manually bracket. But within your menu, you will be able to find a. Um, an automated bracketing system. So, main menu. So we've got these kind of four shooting modes across the top of the menu, and I'm gonna go across to menu menu section number two. Ex Expo comp, exposure compensation slash AEB. Auto exposure bracketing, okay? So we're gonna go into that. Now the top bar on this, this is your um, exposure compensation. So by moving that center point, that's going to either be darker or lighter, depending which way you go. What I'm going to do here, it's AEB, got your little thumb wheel icon there. I'm going to use the thumb wheel. Oh, look. So you've got your zero and you've got your scale. And what that's going to allow you to do is that's now going to allow you to adjust. So you've got your center point which is the camera correct exposure. And then you've got a line either side. You've got a line to the overexposure and the underexposure. And these little bars in between are set increments of a third of a stop. So what this is then going to do, if I then go ahead and shoot a photograph, so I need you need to press your set button. Oh, come back. So back into your menu. In order to activate that, you have to tell it OK. So I'm going to press the set button. And that's showing me I'm exposed by a third of a stop under and over. So the first one generally is your correct exposure. Camera saying f2.8 here at a thirteenth of a second. ISO 100, great. Take the picture. Hmm. Don't need to do anything else. Press the shutter button again. Look, it's gone under. So from a thirteenth of a second, it's gone to a fifteenth of a second. ISO hasn't changed. Aperture hasn't changed. You can't change this now. Press the button, you've then got your slightly darker image, and it shows you at the top there, plus minus, minus one third. Go again, look, your mark has gone over to the plus side, it's, it's the first increment over the zero, that's no overexposing by a third of a stop, which has gone to a tenth of a second, and those are a little bit brighter. So if I just press the playback button now, you should be able to see, so that's what the camera thinks is right, 
that's darker, that's brighter. Obviously, these are fairly small, fairly low level increment changes, but it gives you an idea of the, the higher the range of your... Um, uh, yeah, the higher the range you change your increments to, so if you go to two thirds of a stop, a stop, two stops, three stops, you're going to get a slightly different result. You're going to get lighter and brighter in, and darker images. So we're back. Are we focused? Yes, we are. So that's kind of how you find it on your cameras. As I said, camera to camera, brand to brand, model to model, it's different. But this is why God gives us manuals. Um, if you haven't got a printed copy of manual, I've said many times, go onto your manufacturer's website and you will be able to find a PDF copy and you'll be able just to fling through and find it. No worries. So let's go back to the presentation. And all of a sudden, I appear to have lost my um, let's just go back in there. Right, okay, so here we go. So exposure bracketing, we've talked about that. So exposure bracketing, auto exposure bracketing. Come on, computer. So this is the last slide, bear with. I just love when the technology catches up with you, it's great. I'm actually saying this, the weather we've got at the minute, I don't know about you guys, but here in Basingstoke it is grey and horrible and windy. Um, so this is the kind of time you might use exposure bracketing because, you know, just to try and get a little bit of punch, a little bit of contrast in your image. Right, but auto exposure bracketing. So we've shown you where it is on the cameras, ish. Um, so the majority of our cameras of our DSLRs now, our mirrorless cameras, bridge cameras, you know that type of thing, have an auto exposure bracketing mode, AEB, and it can shoot a bracketed series of images, a variety of exposures. But the increments, the differences will always be equal. So you can't shoot what the camera thinks is right and then go to an AEB. You can't shoot an AEB overexposed by one stop and then underexposed by two stops. Can't do that. Um, apparently it's horrible in Christchurch as well. Thank you, Adrian. Um, so these can be set in third stop increments, as I've said. You can go to a third of a stop, two thirds of a stop, one stop one and a third, one and two thirds, two stops. I think some of you can actually go up to three stops as well. But you can set these in one third increments. So it's a bit more precise than just going huge amounts. So the auto exposure bracketing is generally available in program, aperture priority and shutter priority. Okay, so those three first manual modes we've talked about won't work in manual, in M, won't work in bulb. If you've got a bulb, a, a B functionality on your on your function dial won't work in that. It will also not function in auto. Okay, so any of your auto mode won't work. It's a manual functionality of the camera, therefore it will not work in auto. Because in auto, the camera basically assumes you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, you're stuck in auto because you don't know how to use the aperture, the shutter, the ISO, blah, blah, blah. So it doesn't think you're clever enough to know what auto exposure bracketing is. So it purposely withholds that functionality along with a lot more. So here we have three images, okay? Um, Petworth Park from memory. So center ones, camera suggested. I'm tripod mounted, okay? If you're gonna do auto exposure bracketing, you are best, excuse me, to be tripod mounted because A, it's gonna keep your scene Static if you're holding the camera, but you can handhold when you're auto exposure bracketing But you're going to find that sometimes your shutter speeds are going to go quite low So you want to make sure that camera is stable So I would always if you're shooting a landscape something like that I'd always use a tripod or have the camera propped up on something So the camera suggested here. I've gone to f3.5. I don't know why but I have uh, <laughs> Aperture priority that my ISO is set at 50, at ISO 50. Nice and low, um, needs a lot of light to expose, but it also gives really clear 
high definition images here. You're not going to get that grain or muzziness or um, noise as if, if you were, I don't know, ISO 500 or 600 or 800. So camera suggested 30th, fine. With my auto exposure bracketing, I've set it to under and overexpose by one stop. So from a 30th of a second, let's go to the overexposure. It's going to brighten the image out, let more light in. So plus one stop, f3.5 is remain the same, ISO 50 is remain the same. Yeah, but because we're in aperture priority, the camera has decided it's going to change the shutter speed. The only the only way it can get more light in is to uh, to let more light in by decreasing the shutter speed, giving you a, a lower shutter speed value, giving you a slower shutter speed, which is going to let more light in. And that's gone from a 30th to a 15th of a second. So that's one stop. That's one full stop. And as you can see, you've got more shadow detail, more detail in the shadow area coming through in, in, in kind of the bottom third of the image. You're starting to lose that beautiful blue in the sky. You're also starting to lose a little bit of that saturation of the kind of the pinky reds coming from behind the trees. So, okay, we've done that. The camera's then automatically, because it's gone the over, and now it's going under. So underexposed by one stop, f3.5 and ISO 50 do not change. The only thing the camera's changing to underexpose is the shutter speed. So it's doing this for you as a matter of course. As you saw a minute ago, you just have to press the button. You don't have to do anything else. Okay. So camera suggested, camera reckons a 30th of a second. You've said, okay, let's underexpose this time by a stop. So it's, it's letting less light through to the sensor. And what it's doing, it's increasing shutter speed. So we're a faster shutter speed, a higher number of 1 60th of a second. And you can see there, you're losing all that shadow detail. All the shadows are going a lot darker. Um, you can see more kind of, um, more of that color coming through, the reddy, uh, yellowy coming through from behind the trees. And that sky has gone an even richer, more saturated blue. So when you underexpose, something manually or in, in this situation what you're doing is you are reducing the amount of light getting to the sensor and what that is doing that's going to um, retain your highlight detail. If we overexpose you're letting more light through that you will lose the highlight detail but you will gain more more detail in the more shadowy areas so the bottom of the frame here. Okay great Paul why would I do it? Well, we've already said, you know, you want to get it right. Yeah, um, you want to get it right. Bracketing, at the risk of being crude, is basically in a polite way of saying covering your ass. Yeah, you're not sure whether you're not happy with what the camera said. So let's give it this and give it that. You want to make sure that you're, you know, you're covering every eventuality. You're going to get a half decent image out of this at the end. So it's basically it's covering your backside, it's making sure you get it right. High dynamic range is another reason that people might use exposure bracketing or auto exposure bracketing. Okay, Paul, what's high dynamic range? It's otherwise known as HDR. And the majority of your camera phones, compact cameras now, have HDR as an absolute, as a basic function. And when you create images using exposure bracketing, you generally find a lot of people will use them, combine those three images in your post-processing, so post-processing, so in Photoshop, in Lightroom, in Adobe Bridge, in whatever software, you know, um, Adobe Photoshop Elements, whatever you happen to use, there's generally a bit of software out there to do, uh, to create what we call an HDR image or a high, uh, high dynamic range image. And the reason it's called high dynamic range we'll get to in a second. So an HDR image will generally use an odd number of images that you've shot, that have been shot over different exposure values. So you've shot them as we've said, so you can get, you know, a decent shot, but by, you know, you can get something you want to use. But by over and under exposing, I mentioned a second ago, when you underexpose, you make the most of that highlight detail. When you overexpose, you make the most of, 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 of the detail and the information in the shadowy area. And when you shoot 
straight what the camera thinks. The camera suggested exposure. You're going to pick up all of that mid-tone, so all the other stuff in between. HDR images use three, well, they use odd numbers of images, minimum of three, and I've seen people use, you know, I'm aware of people using hundreds of images. But it's always going to be odd numbers, because what you're going to have, in theory, to create a half-decent HDR image, you should have an equal amount of overexposed, an equal amount of underexposed, and then your camera correct, what the camera thinks is right. So one, generally a camera correct image is the base of the HDR image. It's going to capture that mid-tone detail. Yeah? The underexposed images will capture the highlight detail in your scene. And as I've said, the overexposed images will capture the shadow detail in your scene. And these are very important because the whole point of high dynamic range, the reason it's called high dynamic range, is people that use HDR, create HDR images, they want to show everything in the shot. They want to show what's in the bright areas, in the dark areas, in, in kind of like the mid-tone areas. Um, personal preference. Personally, not my cup of tea, but hey, horses and courses, yeah? So in HDR, when you combine these together, you see all, all the detail in the three tonal areas of that scene. So you've got, you might have taken, I don't know, um, 20 shots at different exposures to capture the highlight, 20 overexposed, uh, underexposed shots. You might have then captured 20 shots overexposed to get what, what's in that shadow area but you've then got that one so that's an that's an even number that's 40 but you've then got that one camera correct inverted commas section which then image which then means you've got a bit of mid-tone there's going to be mid-tone flying around in the other image images don't get me wrong but that camera correct image always gives you a really good base a really good starting point so here we have if i'm correct there we go so this is an HDR composite of what of that scene that I showed you originally. So from those three images, from the 30th, the 15th, and the 60th, the second, from those three images, the camera correct, the over and the under exposure, this is what we get. So in the camera correct exposure, you could not see much in that foreground. You, couldn't see, you could see there was some grass there, but you couldn't see that path work, working its way through. You couldn't see much of what was behind the trees. You could see the trees in silhouette, but you couldn't really see the little bushes behind it and how many trees there actually were. And the sky was, you know, a certain colour. We've got now, using the, the camera correct, the over and the under exposure, what we've got is we now have got this, this image, and you can see everything in the scene. Great. Photographers that tend to use this more than anything else are going to be... Um, interior photographers, some landscape photographers love it, uh, especially if you're shooting in a very, very high contrast situation. Um, also, yeah, interiors, landscape, that type of thing, yeah, where you're really trying to show as much sort of detail as possible. You don't have to bracket for just exposure, yeah. Bracketing is covering your backside, yeah. We've um, I'll make it a bit more eloquent this time. Um, it's getting things right, okay. So here, I've bracketed for depth of field. Okay, so I'm in aperture priority. Um, and I've started off, by the way, I do not go out with a pink watering can whenever I go and photograph a beach. That happened to be there on that groin. Honest gov, that's exactly how it happened. Um, and of course, it, you know, it's like, oh, great. I love that, that looks great. So I used that. Um, so what we've got here is we have got first image, F8, 60th of the second, ISO 100. Yeah. So the only thing that is not changing in these images is the ISO, because I'm on a tripod, so the camera's not moving, and I'm trying to just trying to make sure I'm happy with the depth of field. And as an aside, as you kind of change through your, your aperture settings and as your shutter speed changes accordingly, Especially in a situation like this where the sun's about to set, 
you do get some interesting little um, um, changes. So F8, 60th, I've gone, do you know what? I'm not sure about that. So I've gone to F11. Yeah, okay, that's okay. I knew I didn't want any less than F8. I knew, I'd made my decision. I wanted a decent amount of depth of field in there, but I didn't want it, you know, I didn't want, I, I didn't want to start at F11. I didn't want to start at F16, yeah? And I didn't want to go as low as F2.8. I wanted a little bit of detail in and around that rather bright, rather lovely watering can. I'm sure some child has missed that. Um, I did leave it, by the way. I didn't take it away from my own private collection, just before anybody says anything. Um, so yeah, F8, 60th, ISO 100. So I've then gone to F11, aperture priority. So the camera is then going, okay, you're closing the aperture down. So I then need to compensate, leveling it out. Come on, guys, we know this, yeah? And it's gone to a 30th of a second. You're starting to see... And the groin in the background, that little jetty in the background, just over the handle of that lovely pink watering can, a bit more detail creeping in. And as we go to the final image, F16, at 15th of a second, ISO has remained at 100. I've not changed that at all. Yeah, you're getting a lot more depth of field. There's a little bit more detail in the groins as you go through the, um, um, the range of apertures. And you're getting more detail in the water, the waves in the background, and what you're actually seeing as well. Is there's people on that um, on that jetty behind the groin, and they're becoming sharper. What's also becoming sharper is the sky, a little bit, you know, just marginally. But yeah, so you're getting that. So that's how you bracket for depth of field. I do it a lot in what I do with the, the food. Yeah, I'll look at something, and go okay, I quite like f five point six, but let's just go a stop over and a stop under. So I'll go from five point six to f eight having adjusted my exposure accordingly, because generally I shoot manual when I'm shooting food, and I'll then go back to F4 as well, just so I've got a couple of little options if the client doesn't particularly like the fact, don't think that they don't think there's enough detail in the F5.6 shot, or they think actually there's too much detail in the F5.6, so I've got a couple of options, yeah? So when you're bracketing your depth of field, you maintain your point of focus, um, using your aperture, and then you change your aperture basically to achieve the desired depth of field. Yeah, and as I said, this is just covering your backside. This is giving you a little bit of wiggle room. Yeah. <clears throat> because these screens on the backs of our cameras, when you're out and about in the studio, for me, working in a studio situation, I've got the camera camera tethered as it is now. The camera's plugged into my MacBook. And rather than looking at a three, three and a half inch screen on the back of the camera. I've got a 13 inch monitor and I can see the image full screen and I can see, yeah, that's enough depth of field, that's not. When you're out and about taking pictures like this, you're not gonna have your camera plugged into a laptop. You've got your screen on the back of the camera and they're not massive. So by you can see a little bit, but just these subtle changes, these subtle differences, by shooting a bit differently, by giving yourself that little bit of wiggle room, by covering your backside, going from F8 to 11 to 16 to make sure you've got what you want, Happy days, yeah? It takes seconds to do, and you've got a little bit more play. You've got a little bit more to play with. Bracketing for white balance. Now, white balance is um, very subjective. Um, there should, in theory, be you know a correct and an incorrect, but as we talked about the other week with white balance, it's really, really subjective, really, really personal preference. So what I've done here is I've got three images shot at the same time. I think I've used these with a white balance previously. So you've got daylight, shade, and cloudy. I started off with daylight, and I know that the shade and the cloudy settings in, in daylight, in normal daylight hours, will come up a little warmer. And I wanted to give the image a little bit more warmth. So what I've done, I've, got, I've achieved subtle differences. Cameras on a tripod, same settings. The aperture hasn't changed, the ISO hasn't changed, the shutter speed potentially has changed depending on the available light, but that's a different kettle of fish completely. And um, we've all seen that happen. But all I've done is I've flicked through my white balance settings. I've gone, right, daylight's okay. What does it look like shade? What does it look like in cloud? And as you can see, you've got a bit more relative warmth coming through. The colors have changed a little bit. And then you pick, to be honest with you, I quite like the shady one, looking at it myself. So this works really well outdoors and in specifically outdoors in low light situations. Um, 
yeah, when you've got a sunrise or a sunset, something like that's going to work really well. You're taking a landscape, flicking through your white balance settings and giving yourself three or four options. It's quite nice. Yes, if you're shooting raw, um, I'm going to preempt a question or preempt a statement. If you're shooting raw, you can change your white balance after the fact. So if you're shooting in, a, in raw format, which I'm going to talk about in a couple of weeks, um, you have much more editing capabilities. You can change your white balance setting once you've shot it. But by doing it like this, I always say, and those of you who learned with me previously on different courses, I'm very much a fan of getting it right in camera or giving yourself all the options in camera. You're not going to necessarily get the same effect by changing in post-process than you would live at your um on your scene at, you know when you take the picture then we have metering we looked at metering last week um metering can have some really really cool effects so it's worth looking here so you know cameras different metering modes can produce some very subtle and also quite dramatic um changes in your exposure but by practicing your metering mode you're gonna get a really, you can get a really different range of results and get some kind of cool stuff going on. So if we have a look here, um, valid tip we've already talked about, matrix metering, pattern metering, depending on your brand. Um, that's straight out of the box, that's what the camera defaults to. And yeah, I went with that. Then I threw the camera to spot metering. The point of focus for reference is on that horizon. So where the sea meets the sky, kind of bang slap in the center. Now we know that spot metering um is more specific and it takes a meter reading from your point of focus at a radius of anywhere between one and five five percent radius from that center point so it's picking up on the highlight look at the difference between the evaluative and the spot it's picking up the highlight the sky has become a much richer much saturated color the whole image has gone a little bit darker but the highlights have remained, have, have, have gone darker, they've got more saturated, they're really poppy, they're really punchy. Uh, you are getting less detail in the shadow areas so under the pier itself on the left hand side and the evaluative. You can see what's going on underneath to a degree. Spot metering, not so much. I then went to center weighted metering. Focus point has not changed, yeah, aperture has not changed. All I've done, I'm an aperture priority. Cameras, I don't know, I think it was F22, something like that. Um, and then ISO has not changed. Aperture priority, yes, the shutter speed is going to change, and that's what your metering is doing. When the metering, when you change your metering mode, it's adjusting the exposure for the light available and how it sees light, and that will adjust your shutter speed. Center-weighted metering. Gone a little, it's, it's, it's gone a bit brighter than the spot metering. You've still got more saturation in the sky. You've still got more shadow. Actually, if I'm looking at this, I'm being really honest, the center weight is my favorite because you've got that lovely blip of highlight, of, of sunlight just coming through the, um, the stanchions, the poles, I don't know what you call them, the big bits of metal that are holding up the pier, those bits, yeah. Um, and you've got that light, it's just pinging through and you can see it, that lovely ping of highlight on the pier itself. And you go into the middle of the image where the horizon is, you've got that lovely ping of highlight just on the little jetty there. And the sea and the sky are a lovely tone. So again, you might think completely differently. You might look at this and think, well, actually, Paul, I prefer the spot. I prefer the evaluative. You know, it's a better image all out. Personal preference. And it depends what you're trying to achieve and what you want to show. So that is that that's pretty much bracketing in a nutshell um what i would suggest and what i would say is when you are looking at bracketing you're looking at anything like this you don't just have you know there are other ways you can bracket you can bracket for iso yeah thanks adrian center weight is kind of cool i like it i mean center weight is kind of my go-to um but those of you who know me know I don't really do landscapey stuff. Um, but no, that's some um, center weight is kind of my my thing, it's my go-to. Um, so you can also bracket for 
ISO. Yeah, you want to make sure you've got the lowest, you know, the lowest ISO on there. You know, you go for a lower ISO or a higher ISO. Black and white, for example, we talked last week. If you shoot in black and white, by increasing your ISO in in your black and white shooting mode, you're going to increase that noise, the grain. You're going to get more texture, more kind of more of a grittiness to it. Yeah, more of a um, little bit more atmosphere. So you can you can bracket for ISO. Yeah, you bracket for focus. My word, you know, you can choose your focus point. You can decide where your point of focus is going to be, and then you can bracket for your focus point if you want. It's just making sure you get it right. Okay, um, so that is that. So next week, I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure yet. We will be looking at raw, and I think I'm going to have a look at raw probably in a couple of weeks. That's a bit of a brain bleeder, and I will be kind of promoting that before because it is seeing it live and having me able to answer your questions is going to be really useful. So we're going to go, do you know what? We're going to break some rules next week. We're going to, be, we're going to look at breaking photographic rules and laws. Um, and then we will look the following week at RAW. Yeah, let's do that. So next week. Breaking the law, breaking the law, dun, dun, love Judas Priest. So breaking photographic rules, and then the week after will be raw. So where are we? It's going to be, the next week is going to be the 13th, and that's going to be the 20th after that. So 13th is going to be um, breaking the rules, photographic rules. And 20th will be raw. So keep that in your head. If you want to learn about raw, try and get on this live. Yeah. Um, I do know we've got people around the world watching. Um, so um, I that, you know, 11 o'clock here is middle of the night for some people. But if you can jump on live and you want to learn a bit more about raw, obviously I'm here. I can answer questions as I see them in the comments. But by the same token, you know, um, feel free to watch at a later date and put questions into the comments or contact me directly and I will always be happy to answer. So that was that. Um, thank you for watching. I will see you same time next week um, or whenever you happen to watch this, depending on your time zone. Um, thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate you jumping on. Stay safe. Enjoy the weekend. If, you know, whatever you choose to do in this lovely, lovely weather. Um, oh, uh, Friday of next week, the 12th, I will be live again on the Park Cameras Facebook page. So facebook.com forward slash park cameras. I'll be doing a food photography Facebook live workshop using artificial light, using um, speed lights and using my lovely Rotolite Neo 2 sat behind me. So an artificial LED constant light source. So yes, that's that. Um, might see you on the 12th. If not, I will see you next week. Have a great week. Look after yourselves. And I will see you soon. Cheers, guys. Thanks for watching. All the best.